Hi everyone, my name is Chris Ng and I'm your week lead for week 16. So this is an adjunct video designed to add a little bit more interactivity as well as to answer some common questions throughout week 16. Uh, again, please let me know if you would like to see more of these videos. So today's discussion is about non-invasive prenatal testing and a common question I get about why don't we routinely use non-invasive prenatal testing for everybody, as well as, as an introduction to sensitivity and specificity. I'm not an epidemiologist, but at the same time, these are the type of statistics you're going to see every day in your practice. And I'm hoping that regardless of whether you're interested in obstetrics and gynecology, you're going to get some really key takeaways that are going to guide your decision making later on. So again, just talking about non-invasive prenatal testing. So during your PBL workshop, you'll learn that non-invasive prenatal testing is a newer technique that basically collects cell-free fetal DNA from maternal serum circulation. So these are, are pieces of DNA that are actually loose within the maternal serum, and this slowly increases over time. So you know, starting from around 10 weeks, it's only it's less than 1%, but slowly increases up until about 20 weeks and starts dropping down again. And really what this allows for is that we can scavenge this DNA from the maternal serum and actually test it for the three big trisomies, trisomy 13, 18, and 21. These are the trisomies that potentially could survive, as well as sex chromosomal abnormalities as well. And there are some key advantages to this technique. The first of all is that there's no fetal risk. Unlike amniocentesis or, or CVS, which carry a risk of miscarriage or losing the pregnancy in about one in 200 for amniocentesis and one in 100 for CVS. This can also be done really early. It can be done as early as 10 weeks. And some of them are actually advertising nine weeks now and is highly sensitive and specific for trisomy 21. Okay, so that sounds pretty good, but let's get into some of the disadvantages. I'm going to tell you why that I may not recommend it for one of my friends. So the biggest disadvantage is cost. So this is going to cost people who uh, about $450 to $600, and that's just for the basic test. If they want additional testing looking for specific gene mutations, then it can go easily up to $900 over $1,000. It also takes a little bit of turnaround time. It takes about 10 days to get a result back. This is different than an amniocentesis where you can get a quick rapid result back on your fish within typically about 48 hours. In addition, it occasionally fails sampling about 2% of the time and it gets a little bit better the further out you get from the 10 week mark. In addition, it, it, there's some early evidence suggesting that it does work well in twins, um, but currently all major organizations, SOGC and ACOG, caution the use in twins as the accuracy may not be as accurate. And again, it will not be able to differentiate which twin has a genetic problem. And in addition, something called vanishing twins, which is actually a very common condition where you actually start out a pregnancy with two pregnancies and one does not survive and miscarries and typically gets reabsorbed back into the body. The problem though is now you have this abnormal DNA that's floating around. We don't know what to make of it. Um, and again, it's really unlike amniocentesis where you can actually get an entire copy of the genetic chromosomes, you are only able to test for a very few specific syndromes, but do keep an eye out on this technique. And finally, another disadvantage is that one of the things you may learn about serum analytes is we can actually use those serum analytes to predict the placental function moving forward in the pregnancy. And we can actually stratify people in terms of whether they need further surveillance for placental dysfunction, which can result in preeclampsia, small babies, or IUGR, low fluid or oligodramios, as well as stillbirth. But let's go into the stats a little bit, you know. So this is actually really critical to understand. So let's take a look. This is a handout from the BC prenatal genetic screening program, and this is available and it should be a link in the description below. So basically when you take a look at a comparison between NIPT versus amniocentesis, the first thing I'm going to highlight is really the detection rate. It is a detection rate for Down syndrome, which is the one we really care about, of greater than 99%. Damn, that sounds pretty good, right? I mean, if I could get a test that's 99% plus detection rate, that sounds pretty good. I'm gonna highlight also for trisomy 13 and 18, it's only about 93 and 97% sensitive. Does it mean that you need to worry about those? Should, should patients be freaking out? Not really. The honest answer is that most of these trisomies uh, present with other serious structural abnormalities that are easily picked up on ultrasound. And the overall incidence is fairly low, unlike Down syndrome. So about 1 in 7,500 births for trisomy 18 and 1 in 15,000 births for trisomy 13. So that goes to the big question. I've got this test now that's 99% detection rate. So why don't we offer this test to everybody? I mean, you get the results earlier. So here's where we go into sensitivity specificity. And again, I promise you, this will be short and this will be relevant for the rest of your career. So sensitivity is the number of true positives 
divided by the amount of true positives and false negatives. So basically what this means in, in practical words is this is the chance if your patient has a disease, they will test positive. And one of the big things you're gonna hear from, from all your clinical practitioners is gonna be spin and snout. And snout, sensitive tests are used to rule out. And I'm gonna come back to that and give some couple case examples as well. Specificity on the other hand, is the number of true negatives divided by the number of true negatives and false positives. So it really identifies the proportion of negative people that are actually cor correctly identified. And a specific test in practical means, it means that the majority of negative cases were picked up by this test. And we use, we use the acronym SPIN, specific test rule in. So SPIN and SNOW. So let's go ahead and give some examples of that. So the first classic example I'm gonna give in general terms is urinalysis for urinary tract infections, one of the most common things you're gonna see in your practice. So in a urinalysis, they, they basically take a look at the urine and they look for a whole bunch of different features. Common signs of infections are gonna be leukocytes, which are white blood cells, as well as nitrites. Leukocytes are sensitive, but are not specific. Nitrites are sensitive, but are specific. So when we think about leukocytes, almost all patients with urinary tract infections will have some white blood cells in their urine. That being said, other conditions can cause white blood cells in the urine, things like renal stones, surgical manipulation, medical illnesses, as well as some medications as well. So the way we use this is snout. So it's a sensitive test. So if there are no leukocytes, because we know this test would have picked it up if they had a urinary tract infection, they're unlikely to have a UTI. On the flip side, Nitrites are a specific test. They are really only produced by bacteria, but not all bacteria produces nitrites. So if you have positive nitrites on your analysis, we can use SPINs as a specific test, therefore we can rule in, most certainly they have a UTI. There's no other reason why they'd have nitrites in their urine. So bringing into a second example, one that I commonly use in my day-to-day -day practice is a, a test called the fetal fibronectin. So this is actually, you don't have to know the details, but this is a glycoprotein that's in between the interface between the amnion and the, the uterus itself. And if there's significant cramping that causes shearing of that membranes, then this is actually released into the vagina. So it's a test for preterm labor. And the big thing about this test is it's very sensitive, 97% sensitivity, decent specificity, about 82%. So the classic case example is a patient presents at 33 weeks with cramping. Um, so again, if the test is negative, we can use snout, it's a sensitive test. Therefore, we can rule out preterm labor because if there's any chance that sh that cramping was significant, those glycoproteins would have been released into the vagina. So therefore, we know that the chance of the patient delivering in the next week is only about 3%. So therefore, we kick them out of our hospital, we discharge them because they say, hey, look, don't worry, our fancy test says you're not likely to deliver. So before you get too further, 3% is not in relation to the sensitivity of 97%. So don't get confused by that. Just the numbers match up a little bit closely. So the next question is, if the test is positive, you tell the patient not to freak out. That actually, the, negative, the positive predictive value is actually only 29%. That's strange. It's a fairly specific test. I mean, 82%, you know, that's a... You know, it's an Asian F, but it's not too bad. Um, but, you know, why is there her chance of delivering only 29%? And the reason why is that most people who do present in, with threatened preterm labor actually go on to deliver at term. So really, it's the fact that your prevalence is actually low. And this is where really, this is where the, we, I bring this back to the discussion about non-invasive prenatal testing. So if we take a look to our SOGC guideline uh, released in 2017 talking about non-invasive prenatal testing, so we can actually take a look at the test performance. And we can see that the sensitivity and specificity for trisomy 21 is going to be 99.3 and 99.8. That's very specific. I mean, that's really good, 99.8. On the right side, you can see in their, in their statements, they say all positive uh, cell-free DNA screening results should be confirmed by, with invasive fetal diagnostic testing prior to any irrevocable decision. And management decisions, including termination of pregnancy, require diagnostic testing and should not be based upon NIP testing alone because it is not a diagnostic test. So wait a second, we just said spin. So specific tests should be used to rule in. So what's going on here? So if we take a look at further down that handout, 
is that when you take a look at the false positive rate, it's a specific test. The false positive rate is super low. It's less than 0.1%, which is really good. But the next line is where you start seeing some of the problems in using non-invasive prenatal testing for everybody. Because when you actually look at the positive predictive value, that yes, in high-risk populations, it is very good at, at, at predicting in trisomy 21. It's greater than 95%. But here's where it becomes less accurate. In low-risk populations where the prevalence of trisomy 21 is low, it's only about 40 to 80% positive predictive value. And this is a really important takeaway there. Sensitivity and specificity are test characteristics. They reflect how good a test is. But the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value, the things that we use as clinicians to actually make our decisions, depend on the prevalence. So a classic example is the run-of-the-store urine pregnancy test. So it is actually a very highly sensitive and specific test. I put an asterisk there because some of you in the audience are going to go, well, what about HTG secreting tumors? Uh, what about false positives What because people don't read it properly? Or false negatives because they test too early? Sure, sure. But for the purpose of this exa example, we're just going to say it's a highly sensitive and specific test. So you take this really good test and then you apply it to the wrong population. So let's say you apply a million pregnancy tests to a, a million biologic males. And you're going to get some positives back. But all your positives will be false positives despite how good it is because your prevalence is low. And that's really the problem with this positive predictive value is that in a low risk population where they're not likely to have a, have a Down syndrome, most of your positives are going to be false positives, or at least not a good chunk of them are, enough to add enough clinical uncertainty that you really do need to go for an invasive diagnostic test. So really that's why we don't recommend NIPT as a first line test. So again, that's where this guideline recommendation comes from. So, you know, if I was asked, do I, should, should my loved one pay for an invasive prenatal testing? Honestly, I would say no right now. $500 for most people is a lot of money. And that can make the difference between being able to ensure food is on the table to make their next rent payment. Um, it reassures you a little bit sooner. If it's negative, the results, you get the results back around 12 weeks and you know, okay, look, I don't have to worry about this pregnancy. It doesn't have Down syndrome. However, if you get a positive test, and they're low risk, you still need to wait for a confirmatory invasive test, an amniocentesis typically around 15 to 17 weeks before you make a final decision. So realistically, it only saves you about two weeks because if you went through the normal SIPS or IPS process, you would get your result back around 17, 18 weeks, be sent for an amniocentesis around 18, 19 weeks, and you get your result then. And then in that, or you could have actually gotten your SIPS result and gotten a free paid for non-invasive prenatal test, which is free for all BC residents if you have a positive screen on your, your SIPS testing. So you can get the benefit of a non-invasive testing with prenatal test, which is not risking your pregnancy, but you could save that $500 and invest it in your kid's education, their future, or honestly just making sure that, that you, know, you spend that money on yourself and your relationship to make sure you, your things don't fall apart after the baby's born. So this is still a very good test, but it's really important to understand test characteristics because it's easy to get suckered in by seeing really good stats, like 99.8% specificity. Um, so you just have to understand why. So hopefully this answers some of the questions that you guys may have about why we don't offer NIP testing as a primary screen. I will say that this may eventually become our primary screen as prices dropped. If I could get this test for free, I probably would take advantage of it. But for now, I'm happy saving that money. So anyways, thank you for, your, for listening. I'm hoping you're enjoying your first bit of, of uh, lectures. If you have any questions or any suggestions to make this more interesting for you, um, please give me a shout. And I will see you guys in that large group workshop a little bit later on next week. Okay, have a good day. Bye.